All right. Well, hey, you guys, this is Josh with Homesteading Family, and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. Uh, I have got a fun guest today here, uh, Carson Ripstein, who will be joining us in just a few minutes. And Carson works with Redmond, uh, Redmond Salt. And I think a lot of you are probably familiar with Redmond. If not, you're going to get a chance to get to know a little bit more about them today. And we're going to be talking mineral supplements for livestock. Um, uh, supplement, mineral supplements for livestock is a, is a key um, part of your homestead, or it needs to be if it's not yet. We have got to mineralize our animals. We have to help them with that, being that we have them right in containment, in captivity. They don't have room to roam and go find some of those uh, minerals on their own. And so it's something that we're responsible to provide. And uh, I've worked with Redmond for, gosh, I don't know, 15, 17 years, maybe a little bit longer now. They've been our source for minerals just because they're uh, U.S. made. I like their practices. They're organic and they're just a rock solid um, mineral supplement besides a lot of other products which we can touch on. But but today we're going to focus on why you need to mineralize your animals and supplement those minerals, um, what they need and how to get it. Now, I do have to give a disclaimer right up front here. We are affiliates for Redmond. We love their products. So uh, if you're new to Redmond or you go buy their products through a link here, we do get a little bit of kickback. So I want to be up front on that. Um, but that is because we just love what they do and um, and want to support what they're doing. And then that also helps get these types of podcasts and information to you guys as well. So um, anyways, a little bit about Redmond here. Redmond's agricultural goal is to nourish the world's future by creating natural and sustainable products for healthier soils, plants, and animals. Since the 1950s, they have supported farmers with regenerative ag resources from their ancient sea mineral and volcanic deposit. At Redmond Agriculture, they know that nature has it right. By using what the good earth has to offer, they can help plants and animals thrive, and I'll add, therefore, helps us thrive, right? Right. Uh, Redmond's customers are happy to report their products improve the health and productivity of their farms, big and small. And I can definitely attest to that as they've been the backbone to our mineralization program for nearly a couple decades. Now, Carson, who's about to join us here in a few minutes, he's worked with Redmond for about five years and uh, he spends his time helping producers of all sizes, both farmers and homesteaders. And, and Carson is both. Um, with their livestock health and soil health. And before working for Redmond, he was in the animal feed and agronomy industries. Uh, Carson's family owns a ranch where they uh, grow their own hay, raise their own hay, and about 130 uh, mother cows. So that would be what you would call cow-calf operation, uh, as well as Carson is uh, a homesteader like a lot of us here, uh, raising a whole lot of his uh, foods for himself and his family on the homestead level, as well as farming and Redmond. So uh, let's welcome Carson Ripstein. Hey, man, how you doing? Doing well. How about you? Oh, doing very, very well. I don't know what the winter's been like for you guys there in Utah, but it has been a strange winter this year. We've got, we got three seasons in like one month, and, and we got like normal winter to that polar deep, deep freeze, to two weeks of rain all within four weeks. And, um, and now it's just kind of like, I don't know what it wants. It doesn't know what it wants to do. <laughs> S similar here. It's, but we've had one season. It's muddy season. It's just been so muddy. We haven't froze. Like we usually have really? a deep frost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, while, while everyone else was polar, you know, had that polar freeze we were, we were 40 degrees and muddy and it's just not stopped being muddy. So it's been, it's been an interesting winter. We'll see how it continues. It seems yeah. like it just never stays the same, which is okay. What elevation? I thought you guys were up pretty high. We, we are. So we're at like 5,000 feet. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why, but you know, the last two times there's been like those polar freezes that have come through. It's stayed very mild where I'm at. I'm not complaining because the last time I was on a work trip in Nebraska, it was like I woke up, it was negative 30 degrees. I called my wife and she said, it's 45 home. So <laughs> not complaining that I was home this year. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's warm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's because we're in a valley and it just went around us or what, but we didn't get as cold as some people did. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, that's that's pretty surprising. But um, you know, weather's it's different all over the place. And um, I'll I'll take the cold over mud season. I'm always happy to get through mud season as quick as possible. <laughs> Me too, but it just hasn't happened. Yeah. I always say if if you and this I always say as as a farmer, but farmer or homesteader. You'd rather it be 30 degrees than 40 degrees because, oh, yeah. you know, 30 degrees or even 20 because you've got frost and you're not in a pile of mud all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you get what we're getting right now where you get mud season and it gets all red and it gets a mess and then it freezes solid. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and then it's, yeah, it's fun stuff. But, you know, that's that's life on the farm, life on the homestead. And and uh, we roll with it. It's part of the seasons and gives us something to look forward to as it clears out and greens up. And and uh, what is life for you as a homesteader like, you know, in Utah about now? What, like, what are you guys focused on or, or thinking about? So we're right now we're calving some cows. So that always makes it fun. It's going really well. Um, and then just the other day, my wife was just coming up with our garden plan on what we're going to plant where, and she's giving me my list of honeydews to get mm. done before spring. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> that's kind of where we're at. A lot of planning for the garden and, and then just the animal things that we have all the time. Yeah. Right on. Same boat here. Yep. We're, we just have had some lambs, some piglets, had our first, uh, uh, first little calf, little bull calf. We got a few more to come. And pretty much the same, thinking about a few trees we're going to plant this year and, and uh, what to do with the garden. So, and, and then all of a sudden it's going to come fast, right? Yeah, it's, it's going to be sprinting. Yeah, she, she's planning. I'm like, why are we planning? It's so far away. And then all of a sudden she'll tell me, you know, we got to plant this weekend and I haven't done any of the jobs I've been given. <laughs> so that's, that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I understand that it goes very similar here. Well, hey, let's dive in. We're, we're talking animal mineralization, and you guys at Redmond are experts in this. And, you know, I think the place to start is just why. Why do we need to mineralize our animals? You know, if you look at animals out in the wild, they don't, they don't have a supplement, you know, box or bucket or anything anywhere. Um, they're taken care of, but we need to mineralize. So just let, let's talk about why that is. Okay. The to me, and I think you did a great introduction to it, is, you know, when animals were roam, roaming wild, you know, in nature, they could go, and, and this is something that I very strongly believe, that animals will go to what they need, and they'll mm -hmm. eat the higher quality product to get the minerals they need. But um, animals were able to go across, there was no fences. They could go wherever they needed to go. They could go and eat green grass most of the year if they were you know, they'd go south and eat grass in warmer climates. So I think the main reason is, is because we now have them in containment. They're in a fence. They can't go and go 200 miles away to where they know that that grass is, or there's a salt deposit they can go lick on or anything like that. They're in containment. They're not able to use their instincts like they're meant to. Yeah. So that that kind of leads to the, the my next question and thought. Um, to, to you know try to help people out with and so say we're pasture raising animals our animals are on pasture a lot of the year there maybe they can't go 200 miles but they do have grasses that are you know growing up out of the soil and and we're feeding them hay that's that's been grown why is that not enough you know what, is is that just regional or what, why don't they get enough out of you know what we feed them I think part of it is regional. There's sometimes that our soils are just lacking in some things. For example, I have a friend and he's a homesteader slash farmer, kind of like me. And we looked at his soil test and, and he had almost everything, but his soil, and then I tested his hay, just had no copper in it. So I think that's kind of why you need to do that is sometimes just the soil you live in um, doesn't have the the minerals in it mm -hmm. so you could just be lacking or you could have some kind of other mineral that might be tying up the other minerals i think it's just hard to find a balance in one area the other thing is um when you're feeding dry hay it's just not going to be as rich as green grass if you were all year you'd probably be it'd be a lot easier for you not to have to supplement but there's very few places in the states that have that so. mm -hmm. 
that's kind of, that's what I'd think on that. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me, even just thinking about how animals consume minerals and we can talk about how to feed them and stuff in a little bit, but they, I, in my observation over the years, there are certain parts of time and definitely in the winter when they're on hay, they consume more and, and even seasonality seems to affect their needs. Right. And right. what must be in the forage versus what their, their body is needing at a given time. It's funny, even even just if you have a wet year compared to a drought, cows or animals in general will consume minerals at a different level. You know, if you get a lot of rain, they might consume more because the grass is more washy. Yeah. So um, it's funny. They can't, the animals are just really have an innate ability to do that. So, Yeah, well, and they really know, right, in the wild. If they can go wherever they want they innately know and go search out both the plants and the sources that provide what their body needs. They're, they're actually very in tune, a lot, lot smarter than we are about getting their own nutrition if they've got the freedom to go anywhere to get it. That's exactly right. <laughs> we just eat cakes and things like that, but they go and eat the right things. It's right. true. I, you, you see it actually. So, so I run my animals in a couple different contexts. One of them is up on public land and they have the one place is a hundred thousand acres, Wow! you know, and uh, it's big country, but the animals, they're not lacking a mineral. And I think it's because they can eat the grasses at different times and they're not forced, you know, they can be very selective on what they're eating. So um, yeah, I, I, I think that's important to remember that animals are really special they're really in tune with their bodies and they're going to go to things that they, that they need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and with that, it's our job since we do have them contained in fences and, and don't always, you know, off, especially at the homestead level, you know, we're not ranching where they've got that kind of acreage. And so they can't just, they can do a little bit within their context, but they can't just mm -hmm. go anywhere to get what they need. Um, and so we've got to start thinking about, okay, what do we need to give them? What do we need to provide for them to make sure they're getting well-rounded diet? And, you know, I'd say one of the other reasons why is, it is, is health. And we've been blessed to have very, very few health issues over the years in our, our journey of, of, again, homesteading. I've worked on a cattle ranch, so I've done a little bit of commercial when I was younger. Um, but we've seen very few problems. And I, I believe one of the reasons for that has been our mineral regime, our mineralization, something I learned from Joel Salatin when I was first getting into it and, and reading him and the Stockman Grass Farmer and just the importance of a, a simple mineralization plan. And that is going to prevent, you know, in my experience, and I, and I love your, your feedback and what you guys have seen both personally and with Redmond, um, it, it just prevents a, a, a host of problems um, by addressing this. Oh yeah. So w when you're not mineralized, when your animals are lacking it, you, you just tend, I think mineral mineralization has more to do with immunity than we give it credit for. Mm. And that's mostly because academia can't make money off mineralization as much as they can off, you know, preventative vaccines and all that kind of stuff. Right. But but when can I give an example? Is that okay if I give yeah, you an example in my own place? Yep. So I had I had this play this pasture, and I'd put my heifers there every year. And every year, and this is before I was working at Redmond, I was working for a different feed company. Every year I had pink eye, and so at the time I was but I was inundated with all you know like vaccine stuff. So I followed the regimen on this pink eye vaccine to the T, and uh, no luck pink eye just continually. And then I actually had the vet from the company I use that for come to our feed company. And I was like, your stuff is awful. Like it does not work. I keep getting pink eye. <laughs> and, and if you've dealt with pink eye, it's the worst. It yeah, is it, the worst. Yeah. And he, he kind of pulled me to the side and he's like, Hey, uh, you know, there's a lot to do with minerals in getting pink eye. You know, I'm like, no, what? I'm feeding the best mineral there is. Why? Like, anyways, when I started going to using Redmond's approach to minerals, which we'll talk about more, but I was able to cure my pink eye problem in that pasture without having to use a vaccine or anything yeah. like that. And it, and that same comes with, you know, if you're having really bad problems with calving or lambing and you're having a lot of issues with retained placentas, there's, there's a list. We could probably make a list of a hundred items that is mm -hmm. caused from mineral mineral issues so yeah it's, it's one of the more important things 
and it's something that you can take care of fairly easily, but it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just preventative. We can do so much with preventative action, just like our own bodies, right? You know, it, we got to have a sense not to just eat the cake and, and <laughs> you know, and, and the ice cream and all the goodies all the time. Um, we've got to take care of our bodies and, and mineralization is a huge part in that. And it's just a, I mean, it's a lack, even our own food supply. It's a whole nother subject, but we know even right. today our, our vegetables, the things that we're consuming, especially if they're in the, in, raised in the industrial context are lacking nutrient. Um, and, uh, so let's talk about what minerals animals need before we get to Redmond solutions. What, what are some of the key things, um, that we need to be getting our animals that they may not be getting from the, the feed that we're providing them or may not okay. be getting enough of or good ratio of. So, so there's, there's, if you look online or if you just study, I, I went, I, when I started working at Redmond, I'm like, I need to learn more about minerals. And so I decided I was going to take some classes at Kansas state university on nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so when I was taking those classes, we learned about probably 15 to 16 minerals you know you have your macros which are like phosphate calcium sodium your chlorides then you get your trace minerals which you go copper zinc iodine iron you know you have a, a large list about 16 those are the ones that you usually hear about in the industry um i actually asked my professor because I had a little bit of different context coming from Redmond. I'm like, so why are we only learning about 16 minerals? And he said, yeah. well, it's be he said, well, it's because that's all that we've been able to get funded to study. So that's all we know about is what the importance <laughs> of these 16 minerals are. So if you, if you look into it, those are the ones that you'll see. If you look, if you just search macro minerals for livestock or trace minerals for livestock, the most extensive list you'll probably find is 15 yeah. minerals. Okay. Well, let's, let's um, talk about salt a little bit and why salt is important in that mix. Well, I'm glad you asked that because usually people leave out sodium, which mm -hmm. if you look, if you look at the blood profile of, of livestock, it's the most prevalent and probably one of the most important minerals is actually sodium. Um, sodium has a lot of metabolic functions, you know, the sodium potassium pump and all those things that work within our bodies and make it function properly. So if you were going to supplement one mineral, I would say you would probably want to supplement sodium using salt, sodium chloride. If I was to do one mineral, that's what it would be because that can fix a lot more things than that, all the others. But, um, so that's kind of the role in salt. Salt's probably one of the key minerals and one of the things that animals need, we know that humans need it. If we're short on salt, we're short on electrolytes, we get dehydrated, et cetera. Same thing with animals. Yeah. So I've got that list of 16 or so plus there's, I mean, how many, what is it? Is it, I think up to 80 something by the time you add in all the trace, right? All the trace minerals, right. and yeah. all the, the, the little things. And right away if you're new to this you're gonna go how in the world do i get my animals all of those you know minerals i mean salt's not too hard to think about but uh you know you can buy a salt lick or you know you think of red men we often think of salt but but we need to get all of those and, and if you do a little research some people have some pretty elaborate regimes of of individual minerals especially for the top you know eight or ten or so uh, up to the 16 you know of getting them and, you know, this, this kind of leads towards, you know, Redmond's, uh, you know, solution, which is just a natural solution is what I love about it. Um, but that's a hard way to go. And, and um, so how do we start getting the animals, all of those minerals in a balanced way? How do we know how much to give them this or that and, right. and uh, start to su uh, supply that need? Well, first I'll tell you what the uh, normal animal feed industry will tell you to do. And then I'll tell you what I think, if that's okay, Josh. Yep. So yeah. normally what people will do is there's a thing, it's called NRC. It's National Research Council. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who've done all the research to tell us a range in which we've, they think that animals need a, a supplement. So like for instance, calcium, they'll feed enough, they'll feed no calcium and find out where it's not enough calcium 
and then they'll feed too much to find out how it's toxic and then they'll create a range in which your animal should be in so what will happen in most mineral companies people who are selling minerals is they'll get that list from nrc and then they will give you a hundred percent of the values within that so they'll say oh we'll pretend your feed has no minerals and give you a hundred percent of the calcium which if you're feeding if you're going into minerals i talked about how they feed too much and it was toxic mm -hmm. too much is just as can be just as bad as not enough just like in any of our diets you know so the the industry will tell you go buy the most expensive mineral that's balanced at 100 percent nrc levels and then it's so nasty that your animals won't eat it so we're going to make sure it has to have grain and molasses so that they'll actually eat this stuff <laughs> And uh, that's what the industry would say. That's how you balance your minerals. Just trust the nutritionist. He he's gone to college and has a PhD, so he just he just gives you a hundred percent, and you don't have to think about it. I I've not seen that be very successful. One because it's extremely extremely expensive to do that. Mm -hmm. Two, that is not how nature works. And the other one is. Just like if if I started just supplementing you minerals, you still wouldn't be as healthy as if I told you, here, go eat this porterhouse steak, get the minerals from that compared to eating, you know, a mineral supplement from Walmart or whatever. Mm -hmm. You, It's really hard to supplement like that your way to health, and that's for yourself and your livestock. So... The way to stop having to worry about that, because we're not all going to be nutritionists. We're not going to all read the book that's like this mm -hmm. thick about <laughs> the National Research Council. Right. Is, is to realize one thing is that our grasses and our hay has quite a bit of our minerals in it. It, you know, it has a good amount and we, and, and we can got to, we've got to trust that we don't need a supplement a hundred percent. And that's not healthy or even needed for animals. But realize that um, products like that are whole products, and one of those would be Redmond. We're not the only one who has whole natural products, but we do have great natural products. Our products have 60 plus minerals that are balanced pretty much by nature, not by a nutritionist. It was balanced by nature. And, uh, and through that, we can supplement our animals really cool can I, i'm going to share a little bit of cool interesting stuff about that in the 50s there was a doctor his name was dr maynard murray um okay. he did a, he did a lot of research on sea seawater well the thing that fascinated him was the animals in the ocean and things they weren't having the med the diseases that we that the animals on land were having so he did research and he compared all the navies um Navy went and tested all the seawater and he tested all the mineral profiles from seawater and from and from and and realized that seawater actually had very similar mineral profile to human blood and cattle blood and other livestock blood. Cool. Yeah, isn't that cool? And isn't it crazy that no this hasn't caught on? <laughs> and so, anyways, so he so the seawater in which Redmond is a sea salt, has the 60 plus trace minerals at nearly the same levels that our blood needs. So, and, and the form that they're in is very available to the animals. So when you're using a product like Redmond, you have to realize I don't have to formulate it myself. Nature's pretty much formulated a supplement for my animals. All I've got to do is put it out. And, and there's always times that once in a while you'll realize like my friend, that still he didn't have enough copper. So he can buy one of our, we do a couple that we boost a couple trace minerals or some macro minerals. So he was able to get something like that to fix it. But I think the main thing to realize is when you're using natural products that nature knows what to do with, animals thrive. It's just, it they do so much better on that than if you have a product that you put out and it's got grain and all this other stuff and DDGs for them to eat. Yeah, it might have all the minerals on the paper, but my animals, I, I've done both. My animals perform a lot better feeding sea, sea minerals that come through, through our sea salt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's been my experience, you know, not having the trials of, you know, different contexts. I've had it, the different contexts of living in different areas. So, 
you know, the high dry 5,000 foot plus of the Southwest mountains, uh, very mm -hmm. sandy soils, very leached soils. Um, the clay of, of the South, Southeast and, and lived out there right. for a while. And now here in North Idaho, where we're a little more silty, loamy forest soils. And, you know, we've used Redmond salt throughout all, all of those locations. And, um, uh, they've always served, you know, always served our needs. They provided that balance across those, those different environments, uh, to keep the animals healthy. So tell us, I mean, so Redmond, Redmond is Utah and mm -hmm. you're talking about sea salt and balanced ocean water and mineralized right. salt water. So tell us a little bit about where you're getting this being that you're um, not on the ocean or even the great salt sea there in Utah. You're you guys are up in the mountains a bit. So tell us about your product and how you're getting this sea product. That's a great question. I'm glad you tied it back into that because people are like, this guy's crazy. Where's he getting this in Utah? So most of Utah, all the way into like um, New Mexico and the southern in, in that area, was co once covered by something called the Sundance Sea. Um, that was during the Jurassic period. Um, and when that dried up, it left a layer of sea salt, okay, underneath the surface, which is at sea level. So sea level is, I like I mentioned earlier, we're at 5,000 feet. So below us, 5,000 feet under most of Utah would be this Sundance Sea layer of salt. Hmm. The, uh, the interesting thing is, is right where we're at in Redmond, Utah, there was a fault in which the layers of salt was pushed up to the surface. So it would make zero sense for us to go try to mine sea salt from 5,000 feet deep. But where it's at at our place, it came up to the surface, so it was very easy for us to mine the sea salt from there. Okay, you got to give a little context. When you say a layer, it's interesting. It's easy to think about, you know, a few yes. inches or a few feet. But there was this layer that I don't know how thick it was that then threw, threw that geological movement became vertical, but how deep or what now wide, I guess, is what it would be. Um, I, I don't know if you went like, oh, you know, outside of where we're at and you went to and found down how, how deep it would be. But I'll tell you that our, our deposit, you know, when it was pushed up, it goes from five, you know, from surface down 5,000 feet. So I don't know. It's, it's a lot of salt. There's a lot right. there and it's all salt. So if you go into a lot of mines that are mining something like salt or things mm -hmm. like that, they'll be mining veins. We're not mining veins. You you've been down in there. The oh, everything yeah, you probably... see is is salt. Like it's... as soon as you hit, it's all salt, and that's what holds us up. That's what it is. So it's not like we're finding these veins that were splintered up. Um, it's just a big chunk of salt that it's like a mountain of salt that's under the ground. That's from sea from uh, five thousand feet down to sea level, so I I, I that actually be interesting for me to learn is how deep it is other places, but um, yeah, it's it's a lot. There's a lot. We we would never run out of it at the pace we're going in our lifetimes. Easy. Yeah, you know, it's, it's or, a pretty cool deposit. It's like God gave us this resource here and you guys I've been there I've been I think at least 800 feet down in the mines and I mean it's pure salt you can lick the walls which we've got a picture of Carolyn and I actually <laughs> licking the walls there where it's just you know pure salt so it's it's amazing operation that's one of the things that's really cool is you guys a lot of salt companies are, are and I, I don't know if we want to get too far into the, the mechanics of this but they're doing a lot to manipulate the minerals and pull them out or put them back together to create the different things they want. And, and, you know, and then get the, I, the, the, you know, the refined salt Redmond is just literally taking the salt of the ground and the nature that it, in, in the way that it was created, the form that it is and extracting it. It's a very simple process because it's all there, as, you know, Carson, as you were saying, right. Just the way it needs to be, the way nature's intended it. And you guys are just taking it out and, you know, basically distributing it or packaging it based on, on different uses. And in this case, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking to animals. Um, so how, 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 how do you feed? Um, well, one, what's the name of the agri product for Redmond salt that most people are going to want to use and, and how 
do we feed that to make sure the animals get what they need? Okay, so we, we were in, in the 50s and 60s and 70s as our agriculture division was growing. We were really good at naming products. We named it by the size of the screen they ran it through to get the size of the particles. So uh, <laughs> so our, our salt, just if, our, if you want to feed our salt, which is our main product, our best-selling product for animals, called number 10 fine. That, okay. like I said, that's the size of the screen that you're using. So there's number 10 fine, there's number four. Those are our two just plain salt mm -hmm. products. Um, so those are great because you can feed that to any livestock. If you have your sheep, your goats, your chicken, everything can eat that. No matter mm -hmm. what livestock it is, it's not formulated for something special. So that's the main one. And that's probably the base. And then, and then we do do some things like we will formulate for people who are lacking in stuff. One of our more popular products is number 10 fine with garlic. Um, the garlic is built as a fly tick and lice control naturally Works. occurring. So it does work. You know, I always tell people as long as they're eating the salt, it works <laughs> like it's just simple as that. Um, and then we, we do it in bags. You can do it in blocks, whatever one works for you. We can, if you'd like to order it online, you can get it in five pound pouches, which for most people in a homestead context, that makes a lot of sense. It's very easy. You can, you can just get a small package. You don't have to worry about storing lots of it. Um, and then we also do some species specific minerals, um, like a goat mineral, which just we add, we know that goats are short on, usually need more copper. So we add some copper. We have a sheep mineral. We have a beef mineral. So those are more if you're like, um, you know, you're lacking some things or you're feeding dry hay most of the season, things like that. Those are when you'd use those. But we do have we do have added minerals. But the main one is 10 fine and 10 fine with garlic. Those yep. are our most popular products. Well, and the 10 fine is what we've used. Now, we, we actually use the C90. So it does have a selenium because we're definitely right we're selenium deficient, but other than that, we've just used that across the board, across species for and that's, forever. And, and that's a great one. That's a great one. That's one of my favorite products. I didn't mention it, but the selenium 90 mm -hmm. works. It's, it's just a really good balance because you got a couple of the traces that are usually short, which is selenium and copper. Those are two or, and then a couple other traces and you can feed it to every livestock that you own and you'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great place to start if you're not mineralizing yet or you don't know where to go. And, you know, you can talk about copper deficiency in, in some of these areas. And Carson can speak to those things a lot better than I can. But just getting a good rounded supplement out there is the starting place. And for most people, that's going to meet your needs, even for goats and sheep. I and mean, we have both. And and we just feed the, the C90 and we've done great over the years. Um, you know, and then you can work towards other solutions that, that would be a recommendation I would have, um, talking about feeding, let's talk about blocks versus free loose. I've always done the free and loose. Um, I've heard, and you can maybe help with this cause I know you guys sell both, but I've heard that, um, it'd be very hard for the animal to get enough generally from a block that the licking the block it would take take a lot of time. Um, and, and so I don't know, I can't speak to that. The, the loose has always made sense to me. So that's what I've gone with, but I've definitely heard that. Can you speak to that at all? The difference between yeah. loose free and blocks? Yeah. So free choice loose is the best way to do it just because they can get as much salt as they want and it doesn't take time. They're not fighting over space. You know, if, if, if I gave you a salt block and said, get, get your required mineral salt for the day, you'd have to sit there and work at it. If I gave you loose salt, you could just have one lick, you know? So I always say loose salt is the, the best solution. There's context, you know, like, like for instance, where I go up on the mountain in the summer, it's easier to pack a block on my horse and I don't have to have containers and all that to mm -hmm. go all over. So there's times and places for blocks, but if you have the ability, I would feed loose. Okay. Personally, I, I really like loose. Like you said, it would be very hard for an animal to get all the salt they need from just a block. It's 
it, it's way better than nothing. So if, if it's either block or bust, I'd feed a block, but sure. if you can loose, loose works better. Yeah. Any, um, any special requirements for feeding loose? Like as far as container no. and, and, and how we provide access to it. I mean, we don't generally want to just dump it on the ground. Um, I mean, I guess you could, they'd, they'd probably just return to that spot, but. Yeah. And the, yeah, they'd start licking the dirt after too. It's kind of funny if, if you yeah. do that. Um, no, I think the best way is to work within your budget. There's really cool mineral feeders with like the flaps that they can lift up, lift up and get mm-hmm. to, which keeps it out of the weather. Um, I've done things like cut in like a 55 gallon drum, the blue ones that I had one break, I cut the bottom off and use that, you know, people make them out of tires. I think the best, the, if you have a place where you're going to be semi-permanent with a mineral feeder or it's just something that will keep it out of the weather and give them plenty of access to it. Yeah. And that doesn't cost you a fortune. That's what I would recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, let's talk a little bit about mineral deficiency and how to recognize it. So say you're not mineralizing, what are some things you might see and say, maybe you are, and even maybe you're using Redmond and, and, and this is where you might lead to, okay, maybe got a particular issue, but, but, um, what are some ways we can recognize mineral deficiencies? Um, there, there's a, there is a lot, like I said, I could probably name off a whole bunch some of the easier ones to spot is when an animal is lambing kidding calving you know when they give birth if they're not getting rid of their placentas you know if they're retaining their placenta um, that is usually a pretty good sign that you have a mineral deficiency um so if, if anyone doesn't know what that means if your animal is calved lambed kidded and it's been a couple days and they still have the the placenta hanging on that's considered re- retained placenta that's always a good way to that's a, a pretty good um tell to tell you where they're at um another thing to look for and this is just in animal health in general is hair coat is my animals is their hair coat in the summer it's in winter is always hard to tell on hair coat because they've got you know they're built to toughen up but do their is their hair coat shiny and slick and look nice and cleaned off or are they keeping hair you know like in the summer is it time that they should have shed their hair and they still have some some long hairs on there um that's a really good one um when you have when they're calving or something or lambing or kidding, if they give birth and the and the the uh, the baby does not have a lot of energy, things like that, those those are always good good telltale signs. Um, I I like to think that if you kind of get to know your animals, you'll be able to spot when something's not right. Um, but maybe if you got them and they've never been right, that might be hard to tell. <laughs> but um, I, I think the main one is just paying attention to those things like, am I constantly getting pink eye? Am I constantly having foot rot? Am I constantly having scours? Am I constantly having problems with sickness? Immunity is really driven by minerals and being balanced. So I, I think it's just overall animal health that you're going to have to be paying attention to. You know, you can look and and you can you can search like milk fever, you know, or calcium deficiency. And, and there's a lot of different things that you can look at. But if if I'm just looking as a as a steward over my animals, it's those things. Am I having constant problems with this? And are my retaining placentas? Just that list could go on and on. Yeah. What about um, if you've got animals licking the dirt or yes. chewing on your trees or wood posts? Are those um, can those be indicators of mineral deficiency? Yes, horses will chew on posts for different reasons because they're just yeah. irritating sometimes. Bored, but <laughs> yes, if your animals are licking dirt or um, doing unusual behaviors like that, they're eating posts. They're probably short on something, you know. That's probably that's a that was a great one. Those are great indicators that you're you're short. Yeah, I remember the first time I saw that, and I didn't know, and and it wasn't one of my animals. It was a I was at a friend's place, and this was twelve years ago or so, and 
saw a cow just over licking a bear spot on the hillside. I was like, what in the world is wrong with that cow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. like, what? what's wrong with you? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, like we said, animals are smart. They're going to search out what they're missing. I, I've heard of people who are short on calcium and their animals, you like, this is on big grazing land. They found bones and started chewing on and trying to eat bones to get caught up on their calcium. Yeah. So animal, like those behaviors that will tell you, yeah, things are, things need to change. We need to do something. So if you're free feeding this, you know, salt that is a mineralized salt, it has, yeah, you know, all your, your core minerals in, in a natural distribution and, and your um, trace. Um, can the animals over consume it? Is there any danger, any risk to them over consuming the salt and minerals in this form? No. Um, the, the one great thing about salt with animals is they regulate themselves really well on it. So people who are sometimes trying to force feed something, They'll use salt because they know that an animal wants, needs to eat a couple ounces a day or, you know, but they know they won't eat too much. They, they will eat times they might eat more and then they'll back mm -hmm. off. But no, there, there's no harm in, in a product like this that's done by nature. That's the great thing about nature is you don't have to like babysit nature as much yeah. as nature will kind of take care of things. If I was feeding something with 100% of that NRC value that I said, yeah, they could overconsume it and they could cause themselves some toxicity. But it, with our products, you won't have that issue. Yeah. Well, and, and I, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, you'll actually see if you've never fed Redmond, a lot of times the first time you put Redmond out, they will eat quite a bit of it because mm -hmm. they're trying to get caught up on that. So, so you might think, holy cow, how am I ever going to do this? They're eating so much of it, but they're just trying to catch up and then they'll regulate after that. Yeah. If you haven't been mineralizing or you're looking at, you know, you want to switch to Redmond or you're going to change your regime up, buy extra just for that reason, more than you think you're going to need, because sometimes they will consume a lot and know that it's very natural, you know, that their consumption is going to go up and down. So I have to tell my kids and we have it on the board checking minerals. You got to check all the time every day, no matter what time of the year it is, because some, sometimes you'll go for weeks and look at it and it's they're hardly consuming it. But if you don't look, all of a sudden, oops, the, the, the and, intake goes up and the salt's gone and they're out. And and um, so know and, that and that's normal. They, and if they are eating that much right away, that means they're needing it. So right. keep putting it in front of them. I actually had a friend text me. He's a he has some sheep and he he texts me. He's like, "Is it normal for my sheep to eat this much salt?" And I said, "No, it's not normal. But if they're doing it, there's a reason." And it was on, he was grazing some stubble off someone's fields, you know. And as soon as he moved fields, they stopped eating salt. You know, like they slowed way down. So it was something they just needed at the time. So, yeah, if they're eating a lot of it, don't say, well, I don't want them. They are only supposed to eat a, a third of an ounce or something if they're a sheep. Don't, yeah. don't be, try to play that role. Just let them yeah. regulate themselves. My, my understanding is neither humans nor animals can willingly overconsume uh, a salt, you know, mineral based salt, like, or any salt, but particularly this yes. product, they, they, we can't over consume it. We will, our taste buds are everything will go, ah, no, <laughs> I'm done. Had enough. Yeah. Yeah. Your body will tell you and their body will tell them. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, like I said, if you haven't done it, you will think while wow, they are over consuming, but they're just catching up. Yep. Well, and I, and I, I want to touch a little bit on just, we were talking about health and how much that, that, um, uh, mineralized salt like Redmond um, increases health and immunity. I, I want to make sure people know it's not to say there can't be other issues, that this is a fix everything, you know, solution to every problem, deficiency or whatever, but it's a foundation, just like we have foundations in health. And you want to have that in place and make sure that they've got good access um, as much as they need. Uh, over a period of time. And then if you're still having problems, no, it's probably not a mineral problem. And then you've got to start doing your research. I mean, maybe it's a particular deficiency in your soil or maybe there's something else going on. So it's not that it solves everything, but it gives you a good foundation for health. And I, and I know for me, and this is why I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this kind of mineralization and, and Redmond in particular, because I've used it for so long. 
and I've resonated with other people, um, you know, particularly Joel Salatin, who's a mentor of mine. And, you know, and, and he was speaking in one of his books, um, not Homestead Tsunami, but before that, um, it might have been um, Homestead Micro, but about health issues. And, and he was relating that he didn't really speak a ton to deep health issues because their management style prevented most extreme and regular health issues. And that really resonated with me because I've had the same experience over the past, you know, nearly two decades of just free for eating uh, Redmond. And not that we haven't had any issues, but we've had very few compared right. to the people. And I have friends, they're, they're experts, you know, in calcium deficiency and, and different things. And I just always wonder like, okay, um, I'm glad I'm not good at those things. I haven't had to be. <laughs> right. And I believe it's because <laughs> right. of the mineralization. <laughs> We actually like to say that we're the foundational mineral for the farm because, like I said, it you you, it's fun to talk to you because you understand all these concepts. But um, it is not going to be a it's not going to save all, but it will save you a lot of like if you if you're balanced if your animals have a balanced mineral profile, it will save you a lot of problems. That doesn't mean that you're not going to ever have sickness or anything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's a good clarification that. It's a good start and it's something that can be very preventative, but it doesn't mean it's going to take care of every issue you've ever had. But a lot of them, like you and I, if we're drinking our water, we're eating healthy food and, you know, a lot of things that everybody here that's listening cares about, right? We care about our health. A lot of the reasons we're raising our own food and thinking about these things is because we want personal health or health for our families, uh, you know, maybe besides some, some resiliency. And we know if we're doing that, we're generally healthier. You know, I've got a, I've got a, you know, family of 11 and regularly 15 people in the house and we get sick, but we don't get sick as often. As, right. And we don't have some of the bigger issues that we see other people have. And, and I think that's just comes back to that, that nutrition. Yeah. I, I agree a hundred percent with that. Well, we're about out of time. This has been great and very informative. Um, how, um, how do people go about getting in touch with Redmond, buying Redmond products. I think we're going to get you guys a link down below. And I'm supposed to mention here, I'm being reminded, I'm supposed to mention that Redmond is giving you guys 15% off of orders. Uh, if you use the code HF salt, that's HF salt. Um, I don't know if caps are important, but it's capital H, capital F, capital S, A L T. Um, and so know that, but um, besides that link, Carson, where do people get familiar with Redmond and mineral products? And then I would just suggest beyond that, just explore Redmond because you guys actually have several different lines of products. So, so yeah, the cool thing about that link is if you wanted to order some salt for your goat and then you also wanted to order some for your yourself, you can get it all from redmondagriculture.com. So you can use you can use it to get it from there. Um, so we have a couple things. You can go to Redmond Life, which is redmond.life, you know, or you can go to redmondagriculture.com. We have an equine brand, Redmond Equine, um, which you can get all their products on redmondagriculture.com. But if you're really curious, I recommend you clicking on the spot on the top of the header of our website that says blogs. We actually have some really well-written blogs about mineral deficiencies and supplementation and all that kind of stuff. So that could even give you more insight. And then looking for larger quantities, you can always go to find a store store section there, put your zip code in. If you know if you've got um, 80 cows or something, that'd probably make more sense for you to do right. something like that. But but that would be it's kind of simple. And if, if you have any questions, we have a chat button there too, and we can help you with whatever you need. Yeah. Cool. Um, you guys, I mean, you, you know why I like Redmond products. You know why it's important to the you know health of your animals and ultimately to your own personal health. I want to mention a couple of things. Of course, it's USA made. Their operations are very environmentally sound. Um, it's a very simple process. It's mind blowing how simple it is because they're just working with what nature gave us there and that and that salt reserve, I'll call it, and and carefully taking it out and putting it into form. Uh, to use in different ways for us. Besides that, you're supporting just a lot of U.S. families, uh, great family people 
uh, in, a, in a U.S. business. And that's things that for, you know, home saving family and, and for me in particular, are very, very passionate about is trying to bring, bring people resources that not only are good for them, good for the environment, but that are good for, you know, our country and our people in general and supporting good business. So, um, uh, just, just go check it out. And if you are not mineralizing, get on it, get it going, getting ready to get into spring here. Maybe you're thinking about getting animals, your animals are getting back out on pasture, get your mineralization program going. And Carson, man, it's been cool to get to hang out with you again. Uh, thanks for taking a little bit of time to share with us about Redmond today. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Great to see you and we will see you soon. Take care.